So, the talk today that I want to give, it includes plants, but how many of you have seen a plant in your travels, whether it's a sport, so a mutation on an existing plant or a seedling or something, that you've thought to yourself, that's a pretty cool plant. Maybe I should do something with it. Anybody? <laughs> Come on. I mean, how many of you have fiddled with breeding, maybe a hosta or a daylily or something like that? So, really what I, what I like to talk about today is a talk that I developed a few years ago at the request of nursery owners and floriculture greenhouse owners that really want to know, like, how do you do that from a practical standpoint? Um, what's really interesting, I'll talk about in a second, is, you know, how few plant breeders actually breed plants. Really odd. But one thing I like to talk about is function. So, <laughs> what is this? Shower cap. What else is it? Okay. So think for a second about what this is. Think about options in your mind. Mini greenhouse. Mini greenhouse. Okay. What else? You know? A snake catcher. <laughs> you know? Um, my brother-in-law's in the United States Marine Corps. It keeps his feet dry in Afghanistan. So i like to get back to this real quick, though. So these are some of the Athens and, and really southeastern guys that had introduced a lot of plants. You might know this guy. He's got a huge uh, presence, Mike Durr. Um, he and I like to argue a great deal about everything. Um, Bob Head, who's a great plant breeder out of South Carolina. Tony Avent, owner of Plant Delights Nursery. Uh, David Creech at Stephen F. Austin, great plant explorer, goes to China, goes to Mexico, rarely goes home. Um, Buddy Lee, anybody know Encore Azaleas? You know Buddy Lee developed that. What do all of these people have in common? None of them are plant breeders. None of these people are plant breeders. They're physiologists, they're nurses. None of them are plant breeders. So if they can do it, you can do it, right? Absolutely, okay? All it takes is a good eye oftentimes. So let's get back to this question of what is function. When you're plant breeding, when you're looking for plants, when you're trying to find plants, you're trying to find something that has a function. But more and more, it's got to have more than one function. So this, for me, I start seeds with it, okay? A plant is the same way. No longer do we have the ability to select a plant that does well in Louisville and market that plant in Louisville, or Louisville, as we would call it in Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> but it has to have multiple functions. And one of the reasons why is because oftentimes these plants are marketed nationally. Okay? There's a lot of money that goes into to a, a successful plant. Okay? So the first thing is they have to be adaptable. This is an actual publication from the University of Georgia, but it really got me thinking. This is landscape design for mobile homes. <laughs> we laugh, but where are some of the toughest plants that you can find? I look in cemeteries and mobile home parks because those plants don't get a lot of care. So they've got to be tough. So a lot of the plants that I actually have and I'm working on in my breeding program, I found in trailer parks. And there's nothing <coughs> wrong with that. They also have to be climatically adaptable. So Dave Creech is a good friend of mine. He sent me this picture. This is Nagadocious, Texas. Stephen F. Austin in September 2009. In Atlanta in September 2009, we had a slightly different problem. For those who know 285, the airport is about two miles this way, and Stone Mountain is about five miles that way. Okay? Almost the exact same day these pictures were taken. Ironically, almost the same day. So they a plant in the southeast that's going to be marketed across the southeast has to be widely adaptable. It's not just re rainfall, it's temperature. Uh, Dr. Gary Knox was talking about magnolias. One of the big things that they're doing with the breeding is trying to expand the hardiness zone of a lot of plants. Really the goal is if you could get five hardiness zones with any plant, then you could potentially get from New York to Atlanta. That is, I think, 70% of the population you would reach, 70% of the population of the U.S. if you get hit from zone 5 to zone 9 or 10. 
So there's lots of other things too that we have to look at. So oftentimes pest tolerance is of utmost importance. Multiple seeds and interest. Alex, you know, I was over there drooling. There's a little puddle on the floor with the bar, you know, because that for me is multiple seeds and interest. Alex was actually my plant materials professor at Virginia Tech, and I still have all those old notes, and every once in a while I'll go back and I'll think about hornbeam. Oh, hornbeam. Uh, <laughs> But uh, multiple uses, and we'll talk about this at the very end. I work on some what you would probably consider strange plants, but they all have a particular use, and what I try to have is multiple uses. But really, nothing happens anymore without a good marketing program. So if you find something, one of the best things you can do is align yourself with a large nursery or a large, large breeding program to, to make that work. And then, in the good old days, and I say good old days, my actual beginning in plant breeding was from J.C. Ralston because I was a high school intern that went down to NC State and, and wanted to do horticulture. For those of you who know uh, J.C. Ralston, he was uh, the director of the, what was it before it was the J.C. Ralston? North Carolina State University. NC, yeah, North Carolina State Arboretum. And he really got me thinking about this whole plant breeding. And back then, you could have a really good story behind a plant and it would work. But now it's really much more about marketing. So you get into people like this, and I never trust anyone who doesn't have dirty fingernails. <laughs> and neither should you. So I try to get into things pretty quick. So I do have a story for most of the plants. So does the world really need another white camellia? Anybody? How about, does the, does the world need another white camellia that'll do zone 6A? Yes. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Uh, this one tends to bloom very well in zone 6A from Thanksgiving to Christmas. Um, and it's one of those that a lot of these things just kind of happen by, you know, happenstance. There are four species of camellia that went into this. Fortunately, I can't tell you because University of Georgia is patenting this thing. That's my daughter, just for scale. Um, I include her for the cuteness factor, but this was actually one of the parents for this, and the primary parent that, that got me on this, is a camellia that was planted in 1847 at the governor's mansion in Williamsburg, Virginia. And I went up to visit my, my family, and it was blooming on Christmas Eve. And they had been pretty cold. So I said, oh, that's pretty interesting. So I went back the next spring and collected seed, grew the seed out. Those seed reliably bloomed slightly later. So it's going to be called White Christmas, hopefully. Uh, and it's one of those where there's a story. So I saw something that was unusual in the landscape, which as gardeners is what we look for. It's really the unusual. So once you find that unusual, a plant out of place, a plant in the wrong hardiness zone, you know, something that's just different, grab onto that, okay? I don't generally recommend stealing the whole plant, but <laughs> taking a cutting every once in a while or a few seeds, it's not that big of a, an issue. So, kind of go through something else. So that was really kind of a look for the odd, okay? Sometimes we have a targeted purpose. Um, so this is a breeding program that I started, and actually a colleague of mine, Dr. John Reuter, and I have two divergent hibiscus breeding programs. Dr. Reuter, John Reuter at University of Georgia, is breeding for small. And I'm going to talk about small in a few minutes. What I breed for with hibiscus is pest tolerance, and particularly hibiscus sawfly. How many of you know hibiscus sawfly? It's horrible. So it skeletonizes your hibiscus leaves. You've probably seen the hibiscus in your yard. The foliage gets skeletonized. That's what's doing it. So can we make a hibiscus that actually is resistant to that? Well, I like to go big. Um, this plant, not extraordinarily showy, white flowers. Flowers don't open all the way, but it's extremely tolerant, okay? I don't think any plant is resistant to anything. I just say tolerant of hibiscus sawfly. You don't see very much of any damage on it, but the flower isn't much to it. So I crossed that with more grande, big, you know, like 12 to 16 inch flowers, uh, Dr. Moy, uh, out of, I think, San Antonio uh, was the, one of the breeders for the, or the breeder for this, but it's a huge flower. The problem is it's a giant plant. It's unwieldy when it rains. It falls all over the place. So we're trying to get it s shorter, 
But also, we, did, we figured out through some studies that the biggest mechanism for this saw fly resistance is pubescence. So the bug can't actually reach the leaf to eat it, to chew on it. Therefore, it just goes to something it can. This, actually, very glabrous, so not a lot of pubescence. So what we did is we just kept crossing this and crossing this and crossing this until we had this flower color with pubescent or hairy leaves. Okay? In that combination, we've got both of these traits combined. This is something that didn't take a great deal of effort because as you can see, it's relatively large target area for your pollen there. So you can pretty much just do this yourself which is really nice about hibiscus too. This is one of those plants that I think is great that anybody can work with and a lot of progress needs to be made in this. There's about 16 to 18 different species in the eastern U.S. and you can just start playing with this. Um, you can get some really interesting forms really quick. And a lot of these I don't show you the end picture because unfortunately once I do that all the attorneys at UGA start sending me nasty grams and tell me I'm, I'm going to get get in trouble. So the next one that I, I, talk, I talk about, and this is how plant breeders can go slightly astray. So there's this new pest called crepe myrtle bark scale. Okay, Dr. Gary Knox is working on that. It was first found in Texas, in the U.S., first found in Texas. It's, it's closely related to azalea bark scale. It's a terrible thing. Um, I have this fear that it's going to wipe out lagostromia. So I started thinking to myself, we've got to find replacements. And that's another thing that you can always be thinking of as you're meandering through plant catalogs and meandering through botanical gardens. Well, that plant could replace this plant that doesn't do very good in this situation. For example, trying to put a dogwood in full sun in your front yard in a housing development is probably not the best idea in the southeast. So what's a good replacement for a dogwood? This might be a good replacement for that as well. White flowering, nice berries, uh, Cyanathus retusus, it's the Asian cousin of our native Cyanthus virginiana. A lot of people call it old man's beard, okay, or Grancy graybeard. But it's a small tree, and I really had high hopes for this. And we were doing some breeding with it. We were trying to increase the, the ploidy number because when we increase the ploidy number, generally we make that plant more compact. It's kind of an inverse. You have to think uh, inversely about this. So, Increasing the ploidy doesn't generally make it bigger, it makes it smaller. We're actually trying to make this even smaller, okay? So maybe a 10 to 12 foot large shrub to a small tree if it was pruned up. And then along comes this thing called emerald ash borer. And somebody says, well, it's susceptible to emerald ash borer. So guess where this program has gone? Not extremely far. I still have high hopes for it, but we can go and we can go and we can progress. You know, we had to the third generation of these plants, which is about 10 years worth of work, and now it's like, oh, darn it. So now I'm on the lookout for the next Cyanathus retusus and Lagostromia natchez. <laughs> if anybody has any good ideas, just let me know. I'm thinking about Cornus cusa. So, and then there's plants like, does anybody know Sasa? What genus that is? What genus is it? What's the common name? Bamboo? Yeah. Usually people throw things at me when I talk about working with bamboo, but I like some of the smaller ones. Sasa vecchiae, this is one that I, I first encountered actually in Sweden when I was a grad student there. Um, they grow it rather extensively, and it's, that's about as tall as it gets, is 18 inches. So what we're trying to do is actually keep it from running so much, okay? Because there's no such thing as a clumping bamboo. If anybody tells you that, I want you to smack them as hard as you can. It's kind of like when you get off the airplane and the kid's been screaming the whole time, you wish the parent would stand in the door and everybody could just give them a good smack on the way out. So no... Would you say that with the Parthesias? In Georgia, yeah. They, run? they still run, yeah. So... So this is one that will run with time. What we're trying to do, again, ploidy manipulation, seems to work well with sasa or uh, the bamboos and slowing them down in, in their progression of spreading. So we've got some actual octoploids of this, so four times the, the normal number of chromosomes, and they stay pretty nice and compact. So 
In this case, hopefully you won't throw things at me the next time I say this. <laughs> and another thing from a geeky standpoint, too. Does anybody grow this plant? Okay. It's really, I, it's one of my favorite bamboos for the fact that you see the green foliage here on the outside. So in the spring, it comes out green, okay, and it stays green throughout the summer. And then after the first two to three hard freezes, the margin burns, okay? So the margin actually senesces and it turns variegated for the winter. So, you know, it's a very interesting dual kind of a roll plant. And if you've got a, an area that you're willing to kind of sacrifice and let an 18-inch plant take over, it's good for that. Um, but it really needs some more work to make it not spread so fast. So I like Fabaceae. Um, number one, it's native. The biggest trend right now from a nursery and a, a greenhouse standpoint, if you look at year over year sales and percent increases, is native plants. So you can take vines, you can take ground covers, you can take perennials, annuals, you can get all these large categories. But if you categorize, categorize natives, over the last five years, it's been about a 70% increase in sales over the last five years, okay? And that's Georgia numbers. I'm sure it's fairly similar across the southeast. So what we've been doing is working more with these natives, and Thermopsis is one of those, and Fabaceae is the family. What we've actually been doing, how many people know this plant? It's a wonderful perennial. You can pretty much grow it anywhere. Comes up, blooms in the spring, and then it kind of chills out the rest of the year. So it's a, a high-impact spring plant. But what we've been trying to do with this is get beyond the yellow and get other flower colors in. Uh, we've been doing some wide crosses with Baptisia australis, which is false blue indigo. They're both in the same family, Fabaceae, so why not give it a shot? And with this, one of the things we're also trying to do is shorten it. So when you're looking for plants, one thing that on the perennial side you have to be aware of is that they get racked. How many of you go to Lowe's or Home Depot or your garden center and you see these racks coming off of a truck? Okay? So really the goal is 18, 16 to 18 inches or, or shorter in flower, including the height of the pot to be able to get on a rack. So we're really shooting for that, which for us that means that that plant has got to be in flower at about 11 inches. Okay? So short, 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 okay? Size matters, in this, in this case, not quite like we're used to, but we want smaller, smaller, smaller. And we're getting there. Um, I'll talk about an Amsonia later where we have that already. So this is Eastern Blue Star. This is my favorite perennial. I'm one of these weirdos that breeds perennials, and I don't do annuals, I have my limits, but I will do perennials and vines and trees and shrubs. But Amsonia is one multiple season interest and a native. The problem with this is it's generally about four feet tall, okay? So we actually got an idea from Mike Arnold, who's a colleague at Texas A&M. He's found a couple of plants down there that he selected based upon finding them in roads, roadways or right-of-ways to get mowed constantly. So the, the Department of Transportation has used its unnatural selection to select these plants that bloom when they're four inches tall instead of four feet tall. Well, I started looking for the same thing in Georgia, and we found one of these that blooms at about nine to 12 inches tall instead of four feet tall. So I totally stole a colleague's idea. I don't mind it one bit. I'm not gonna give him any credit whatsoever other than this one time in this room. But it's an example of where you can find plants that are unusual. So we didn't have to do ploidy manipulation with this. We didn't have to do any fancy breeding work. We literally plucked this out of a road uh, right away and put it in a pot and said, we got a winner. <laughs> but this is really interesting. This is Amsonia hubrechtii. I, I threw this in this morning. And that's because, does anybody see a difference here? Okay. You got a chartreuse leaf color and a lot more foliage over here than you do there. This is growing in this garden. So I, I challenge you to find it. <laughs> and what it is, is a, it's fastidious. So it's a stem, multiple stems. It's, a, it's a, a sport or a mutation where multiple stems grow together, but generally you get a lot more foliage. Okay, I'll leave one for you. I'm taking the other eight back to Georgia with me. 
but I'll leave one for you so you can see it. So this is an example of just walking through a garden and keeping your eye open and finding things. Would this necessarily have any commercial value? Who knows? Probably not necessarily, but at the same time, just a chartreuse foliage color, when it blooms blue on chartreuse, is going to be pretty neat. Okay? So just keep your eye open for little things like this. A few others. Sometimes it's weird things that I see. This was a Tony Avent. I uh, saw him at a meeting, and he said, you should be breeding north of Scorum. Or he said it's, he pronounced it differently. And I said, what in the Sam hell is that? He said, well, there's a North American species, bivalve, that's pretty good. It's a weed. It's a pasture weed, actually. It's in the amaryllis family. Doesn't do cattle very good. They don't like it, so they generally leave it. Blooms white in the spring. But there's this one that he found growing in a garden in Wales or Ireland or Scotland. I forget exactly where up there he told me he found it. And it's yellow. The interesting thing is it blooms. Our native blooms in the spring only. But this Sawalianum so uh, blooms from October through March, all winter, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I saw this in late February, and it was, this is the picture of it blooming in late February. It'll bloom when it's got snow on it. So we're working to actually cross these to try to improve the range or the hardiness range of this to actually get it farther south. Because this does well up north. This would do great for you but we can pretty much only grow this by putting it in a cold chamber to get its chilling requirement in Georgia. So we're trying to get heat tolerance into this one by using our native pasture weed. So here's one that I'm working on with a, a colleague of mine. You guys don't have too much problem growing cowmia here, do you? You do? Okay. It's a limestone soil, yep. So we have, we have problems in Georgia because of limestone soils in central Georgia and heat. It is just plain too hot. So Dolan Zhang, who's a plant breeder in the department, he and I went on a mission from God, as we like to call it. And we were bound and determined to find Calmia as far south as we could. So we started talking to you folks, okay? Non-plant breeders, plant collectors, hikers, naturalists. And we figured out that there are some pretty far south. This is LA, Lower Alabama, okay? This Mobile Bay right there. And every little red dot is a population of Calmia that we found. And this on Fish River, which I fished there for a half a day and didn't catch a damn thing, um, <coughs> is the farthest southern. So I'm gonna skip by this. This is Calmia latifolia, on brackish water, Mobile Bay, growing in a pH 7.4 soil. So heat tolerance growing in a, a rather basic soil, okay? So, you know, this is the flower from it. Back up real quick. These are a lot of the, the flower colors of the more popular cultivars that are on the market. I like these, you get into the darker colors, so and what we're doing now is we're taking this, we collected seed and cuttings off of these, and we're trying to introgress good flower color, what I call good flower color, so the pinks and, and magentas, into this heat tolerance. So don't ever let somebody tell you you can't do that because there's always an exception, always. And I'm sure you will, you will know you will meet somebody if you're in the garden circle long enough you'll meet somebody that can disprove whatever theory you have. I know they certainly have done me. So vines are another, from a consumer standpoint, nursery growers are always looking for new vines because consumers and landscape architects are always wanting new vines. A lot of the problems is new, 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 okay? We don't have a lot of new vines coming out, so it's something that we work on pretty constantly. Most of you probably know Bignonia, I like it because hummingbirds have fist fights over it. So I like watch, drinking my coffee in the morning and watching a little brawl on my front porch. Um, and there's one tangerine beauty that's really nice. But we tried to go a little bit outside. Uh, there are lots of different colors of bignonia, okay? Um, this has recently been reclassified. 
uh, but you know, very closely related plants. So wouldn't it be cool if we could get this blue introgressed into a native southeastern species? I think that'd be pretty neat. Or even a magenta or darker red because my daughter, who's five, out of the mouth of babes, says that this looks like baby puke. <laughs> um, so it's really not a, a, a reliable flower color if you'd like to go into the industry with it. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get blue into that. And then people always laugh at me because the first time I saw this plant, it was growing on an arbor in a trailer park. Okay, and I said, what is that? I had never even paid attention to it. Never really even cared about it. And then, you know, I kind of discounted it. And then a friend of mine, Brad Davis, who's in landscape architecture, sent me this picture. And this is from um, Knoxville, Tennessee. I had sent him a picture from the trailer park saying, this is really neat. And he sent me a picture of this. And he said, my mind is now changed. If this person grows it, I'm willing to work with it. <laughs> So the big problem with Smilax across the board is it's, you know, very, very, extremely hard to propagate. So this one, it isn't necessarily as much improving it. Sometimes it's figuring out how to grow it, okay? Really, the only way we found to propagate this is by the tubers, okay? We've tried cuttings for five years. We've not been able to get above 10% success rate. We've tried growing the seeds out. We've done everything, okay? I've actually put it in cattle feed because we have black Angus cattle. So I've put it in cattle feed and collected what comes out the other end thinking it, if it went through a ruminant animal. Nope, doesn't work. I've burned it. I've put it in sulfuric acid. I've done everything you can do. I've tortured this poor egg on seed and I can't get it to germinate. So this is one though, if we can get a reliable propagation method, I think would be very, very popular. How many of y'all know this? Anybody? It's one of our only native thornless briars, but it's a briar, okay? It's, all, it's called wedding briar because a lot of deep southern, particularly weddings, this was used as a garnishment, okay, during wedding ceremonies. And it's coming back into popularity. So in the south, one thing, one problem we have is fall color. So when I first moved, I came from southeastern Virginia. We had a little fall color. I came to Georgia, and I went through serious withdrawal. I mean, it was like meth. Uh, I was like, where is the red? But So I started looking for things, and a lot of people might laugh at things like this, but when you walk through the forest in the fall, what's some of the best fall color, okay, where you don't have to look up? Let's think about this. We're the gardening, we're the gardening gurus, but how many people look up these days? past the bat right here, okay? So we need something that's the right height, and roost is a good height as well. So what's the problem with roost? It's suckers. So we've been literally growing out seed. We've grown out about 10,000 seedlings of roost. You can laugh at me all you want. We've selected five that don't sucker, okay? So it is, it can be inherited, and we're looking at actually releasing these. Again, Propagating it once you've got one is really difficult, but we figured out a way to do it using tissue culture or a lab method in order to propagate it. So great, great fall color. And then the other thing that we can't do very well in the southeast is grow a red maple in a landscape, okay? See it growing in the woods and it's gorgeous, okay? All the way down into Florida. But put it in a managed landscape where it's hot and sunny and dry, it doesn't do well. Well, we have a little further south than you guys this Acer Barbatum, which does do well in fields and outside and manage, outside of what I would call a forest or an understory in managed landscapes and has reliable fall color. This is the cultivar Sandersville. And if you see fall color in central and south Georgia and north Florida, generally in a managed landscape, it's going to be this tree, generally. Okay? So we're working a lot with this to try to find red color because it's generally yellow to orange and we've made some progress. The nice thing, this is its native range, but it will grow all the way up from D.C., uh, probably a little north of you towards Cincinnati, and then all the way down into central Florida. So it actually has a wide range where it can grow. And then here's the last one. So we talk about the ultimate in multiple functions. My favorite plant is Osmanthus fragrance. If I had, when people call me and say, I need a plant for, I don't even let them finish, okay? I'm an ENTJ personality. I know what they're thinking anyway. 
So I just, I tell him, I don't even let him finish the sentence. And I say, you want an osmanthus. But there's always something else that we need, okay? How many know baccarus or ground sorrel, okay? It has an extremely wide range where it will grow. It grows here. It grows all the way down to the swamps of Florida in brackish water, okay? I first discovered this plant many, many moons ago. That's a different story. It's interesting, though, in that it generally in the south will bloom twice. It blooms once in the spring, okay, where it has fertile seed that are developed, and then it will bloom again in the fall. The seed is generally killed by the frost in the fall, but it will bloom twice a year, which is really nice. But the interesting thing about this, it's native, but also I can, if I'm a grower, I can root this in 11 to 12 days. I can finish a three gallon container in two and a half months. So I can sell it fast as a grower, but it also establishes extraordinarily quickly, okay? One of the things that I've been able to do is do some convincing of the Georgia Department of Transportation to fund us because they have huge erosion issues. This has a very fine root system. So it's got ornamentals, but it also has the added function that you can plant it in a gully and it will root in a gully and it will cease or stop the erosion problem that you have. So you always have to be thinking of these multiple uses of otherwise plants that people would laugh at you if you suggested doing breeding work with them. And we actually now, ironically, have variegated forms of this. So we have four variegation patterns in this plant as well. It is. Every yep. Year. Yep. They are dioecious, yep. So I always like to end with this. There is no bad idea in plant breeding. All ideas in your head are good ideas. So any questions? How many of you have seen Madagascar? It's my favorite children's. You should all watch it. And then you will know how, how humorous this is. I have a five-year-old. <laughs>